Hello, everybody. Welcome to session five of the Genomic Variant Analysis and Clinical Interpretation course. Uh, today, we'll be talking about variants in literature, how to curate them, and how to understand them. Now, let's, let's start at the very beginning uh, with the Human Genome Project. Um, this project, till date, is the largest uh, collaborative project when it comes to uh, biological projects. Um, it was, of course, officially announced in the year 1990, uh, and in the year 2000, it was uh, declared a success. Um, since uh, this project was such a huge landmark in the field of genomics, uh, it led to a huge uh, upsurge in the number of uh, whole genome and whole uh, exome sequencing um, that we had seen. Um, for instance, if we look uh, particularly at the case of one database, uh, the GenBank database, um, we see till uh, about 2002, uh, there were no whole uh, genome sequencing uh, sequences in the database. However, in about April 2002, uh, a huge number of uh, sequences were reported uh, and the trend continues. So uh, as far as we can tell, at least for the time to come, uh, there will be a lot of uh, whole genome sequencing going on and a lot more data coming in. Uh, if we look at numbers, we see in uh, December 1982, uh, there were zero uh, WGS sequences. Uh, in April 2002, we had about 1,72,000 sequences. Um, and uh, in October this year, we had more than a billion sequences. Uh, these are whole genome sequences. So uh, there is definitely uh, a lot of data out there. Um, but this data is typically still in the raw format. Uh, all these sequences are not annotated. Uh, they are typically just the raw sequence that has been reported in these databases. Um, several other uh, publicly um, accessible open source databases also exist that contain uh, sequencing data. Uh, so typically all these databases uh, just contain unannotated sequences. Um, and as you might have uh, seen, uh, if you look at a sequence, there is not much that you can derive uh, just from looking at uh, an endless strings of AT, G, and Cs. So there has to be some kind of an annotation uh, to the data so, that, so as to be able to make sense of it. So this uh, problem uh, has uh, led to the solution that uh, many people are actually extracting data from these sites, uh, doing their own analysis and uh, creating smaller databases, um, also pulling in data from other sources and making databases specific to a particular problem uh, and in uh, the aim of finding a solution for a particular problem. So for instance, if you're working on cancer, uh, you might go to the GenBank database uh, you might collect all the sequences that are associated with all the uh, genes that are linked with your particular type of cancer. Uh, and you might uh, put all of that data in a separate database. So uh, this has been done a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, and uh, as a result of this, there are several journals, for instance, the NAR, that actually uh, publishes a list of all these smaller databases um, that answer a particular problem or that are meant to address a particular problem uh, every year. And it annotates that list and it presents this list every year. Now, one uh, specific type of these smaller databases, as we've discussed before, are the locus specific databases or LSDBs. Um, LSDBs are basically curated collections of variants in genes associated with the disease. So like I just said, if you're studying cancer, for instance, uh, there will be certain genes that are associated with a particular type of cancer. And uh, an LSDB would typically catalog all these variants that are associated with these particular genes. Um, LSDBs uh, typically contain annotated data that can be critical for helping us understand how genetic variations lead to disease. So um, it's not just a list of genes or a list of variants or a list of disorders that LSDBs typically talk about. Uh, they also annotate this data so that we actually enhance our understanding of how a particular variant leads to a particular disease. Further, uh, LSDBs play a very important role in disseminating this information uh, for instance, if you've discovered that a particular variant uh, after you perform 
and ACMG analysis of it. Uh, you classify this variant as a pathogenic variant. Uh, so you can put it up on your database. And uh, since it's a pathogenic variant in uh, a particular type of cancer, for instance, uh, it becomes of clinical importance. And doctors uh, can then refer to your database and find out uh, whether this variant is pathogenic or not. Uh, as we discussed in the last class, um, there are several uh, cancer uh, therapies or uh, basically cancer drugs that are already out there in the market that are mutation specific therapies. So um, a person uh, with a particular kind of a mutation would be given a particular drug uh, in uh, the same kind of cancer. So if two people uh, with the same kind of cancer have uh, different um, genomic profiles, they might be given different drugs uh, depending on the, uh, the doctor's uh, advice. Now there are several uh, LSDBs already out there. Uh, if I talk only about the NCBI, we have um, uh, dbGaP, which basically talks about uh, genotypes and links them to phenotypes. We have dbSNP, which talks about uh, uh, single uh, nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, uh, which are uh, basically variants in the sequence. Um, we have DBVAR, which talks about structural variants. We have ClinVAR, which speaks uh, specifically uh, of clinically relevant variants. And we have databases like OMIM that talk about um, Mendelian uh, disorders, their genes, and their variants. So how is it that you can actually create a LSDB? Uh, the answer uh, can be addressed broadly by three points, three very broad points. Uh, the first point would be uh, data collection. Uh, the first thing you want to do when you address a problem is to collect as much data about it uh, as possible. So uh, for instance, you can uh, consult other databases. Uh, you can take data from other databases or you can do your own literature survey, uh, collect relevant papers, um, sort through them, uh, and collect your own relevant information. Um, the next would, of course, be data curation. Once you have these papers or this data, you sort through this data, you organize this data in a particular meaningful manner, and you annotate this data uh, with relevant information. Um, next would be further annotation. So now that you've organized your data and you've annotated your data, uh, you might uh, perform a small analysis uh, to address a very specific question. So for instance, um, uh, you want to study um, the prevalence of, uh, from your cancer database, the prevalence of one particular type of cancer in only one particular population, then you will uh, extract your data from your curated data and uh, perform further annotation of only that specific part of data. So that is the third uh, point uh, in which you basically extract some amount of data, annotate it, and then present the results and share them with the world. Um, now let's address uh, all these point by point. Uh, let's talk about literature uh, survey and uh, data collection first. Um, so let's let's say uh, you want to work on uh, breast cancer and you want to collect all possible data related to breast cancer. Uh, what would you do? Where would you start? Uh, the first thing you can do is uh, you can go to PubMed, uh, which is basically an NCBI website. Um, you can enter breast cancer in the search uh, bar that is there um, and you can um, hit enter. Uh, you will see in the search uh, results that you get more than 4 lakh papers associated with breast cancer alone. Um, obviously, now this is a very huge amount of data. Um, and uh, all of these papers may not directly be linked with your particular type of cancer, because even breast cancer has subtypes. Or um, it might just be a review paper and you don't want um, a review paper or there might be other specifications or sp other specific questions that you might be uh, targeting. Uh, in that case, um, in the left uh, hand side here, uh, it's not shown here, but in the panel here below, uh, there is actually a panel that talks about several filters. 
so in case uh, let's say you only want to look at review papers first and get a general understanding of breast cancer you can just click on review systematic review here uh, you can also just read uh, books and documents about it uh, to understand what breast cancer is first um, if you already know that uh, you might want only data related to clinical trials you can click here in that case so there are several permutations and combinations that you can try out and this number would be reduced now if you look at the text availability filters here we see three options um, abstract full uh, free full text and full text now uh, there are these three options um, because uh, of a reason uh, the PubMed database actually uh, talks to several other databases to bring you all the papers uh, that you see out here. So uh, typically it has data from uh, the Medline database uh, as well as from uh, PMC, which is PubMed Central. Uh, so you might find, uh, you will typically find uh, free full text papers there. Um, however, um, there are several papers uh, that are a part of a particular journal. Uh, and are reported on that particular journal's website um, that are actually uh, behind paywalls. Uh, this basically means that these papers are not free to read. Uh, you have to pay the journal a certain amount, uh, get their subscription, and then you will get access to those uh, papers and that, uh, that entire journal. So uh, in that case, uh, what uh, PubMed does is that it, uh, does contain some of those papers as well uh, but in that case it will typically just give you an abstract um, but it will also give you a link to where you can actually uh, redirect and read the entire paper so it will actually link you to the uh, journal's website where you can find the whole paper and if you have a subscription to that paper you can actually read that paper there hence these three options if you just want uh, papers that are only available on PubMed, you can always select uh, free full text and uh, that's the only uh, kind of papers it will show you um, now uh, every uh, paper that is reported on PubMed comes with a unique pmid or pubmed id um, and this is extremely important because once you've collected your data and you want to backtrack and see as to where a particular, let's say, variant was reported or a particular disease type was reported, um, you can uh, do so extremely easily just by uh, noting down the PMID of that particular variant or disease type. Um, and you can just search uh, PubMed uh, for this PMID and you will directly be led to that particular paper. So it becomes extremely easy. Uh, to backtrack and find where the information actually came from. Now PubMed you can access on this link or you can just simply Google uh, NCBI plus PubMed. Uh, you will be led to the PubMed homepage. Um, next, um, let's say um, you uh, also want other data. Um, let's say uh, you already have your breast cancer data, but you uh, are only interested in finding a typical uh, variant or a particular kind of variant uh, which is pathogenic um, and there are other criteria involved other uh, other uh, filters that you want to uh, apply that are not already available on PubMed uh, or you just want to try out another interface uh, in that case you can always come to Google Scholar uh, this is another uh, search engine that will actually lead you to several links uh, to these papers. Uh, there isn't a very uh, elaborate um, filter system in place here. Uh, however, you can use several keywords uh, uh, out here. Uh, just uh, for instance, breast cancer plus um, a particular variant name plus a particular um, author name or something like that. Uh, and it will give you all your relevant results. So this is a, a part of clinical genomics basically. Uh, clinical genomics work uh, typically uh, 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 makes use of such multiple keywords um, and this database uh, is available at scholar.google.com or uh, again you can just simply search for uh, Google Scholar on Google. So this was all about literature survey. You did your literature survey, you collected papers from uh, all of these sites. Um, but there are also several issues associated with literature survey. Um, we just discussed uh, the uh, problem of paywalls. So a lot of the literature is actually inaccessible to us because it is hidden behind paywalls. 
and several studies over the years have de determined that about three quarters of all uh, scholarly literature is actually hidden behind paywalls. So that's a huge number of papers that are not accessible to people who don't have a subscription. Uh, these subscriptions uh, also uh, typically only um, are available uh, to large universities and large medical centers, not even the smaller ones typically seen. Um, and students typically don't have access to these journals uh, by themselves. They can, of course, use their institute's account. Um, so accessing uh, these becomes a problem. Um, and another problem that people uh, uh, point out a lot is that uh, typically a lot of the research that goes on is either publicly funded or it is funded by a philanthropic um, person or a philanthropic organization. Uh, however, uh, the same public or the same organization typically does not have access to the same data that is published. The, uh, the paper that studied or used the money to, to uh, perform a particular study uh, is now not accessible to the people who basically paid for it. So this is a huge uh, problem that a lot of people point to while talking about uh, issues such as the paywall. And there have been several movements such as the open access movement uh, that uh, basically is trying to remedy this situation and make uh, the data more and more accessible to more and more people. Um, now, one step uh, in this uh, general direction has been taken by uh, pre uh, print servers such as uh, BioArchive and MedArchive. Um, now, pre uh, prints are basically uh, preliminary uh, reports of work. Uh, that have not been certified by PRZ yet. So uh, when you um, submit a paper to a particular journal, what the journal does is uh, it will um, take your paper uh, and it will give it to people who are experts in the field in which you have written your paper in. So let's say you have written a paper which is genomics based. Uh, they will give it to um, uh, experts uh, in the field of genomics and they will ask them to review the paper. This process is known as peer review. Uh, and this is actually a very useful and an important process because it helps weed out uh, a lot of problems uh, or a lot of shortcomings or basically, uh, even, even if it's a great paper, it actually helps uh, make it even better uh, because uh, you get a lot of suggestions. Uh, that you then have to make, uh, you have to incorporate those changes. So a uh, peer review process is actually uh, a very important part of publishing. However, uh, in the interest of time, uh, these um, preprint uh, servers actually publish the papers uh, before they've even been uh, peer reviewed. Uh, and this has been extremely important, specifically in the case of the ongoing pandemic, where uh, time was of the essence. Um, and uh, any research that was being conducted anywhere was uh, typically reported to one of these two sites. Um, and uh, it was instantly made accessible to uh, everybody the world over. So sure, there were some mistakes or some problems uh, might have been there. Uh, but uh, on the whole, uh, there was a lot of useful data that became instantly accessible to a very wide um, number of people. Uh, that actually helped everybody fight uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Um, another such endeavor has been taken up by uh, Sci-Hub. Uh, this is a website uh, that was actually started uh, by Alexandra Elbakian in 2011, uh, and she's the one who still maintains it. Um, on Sci-Hub, you can actually uh, download uh, uh, the complete paper, even if it is behind a paywall. Um, so you can either just read the paper online or you can download PDF versions of it. Um, how uh, El Bakian does it uh, or uh, Sci-Hub does it is basically they use leaked authentication credentials from education institutes. Uh, they gain access to these uh, papers through these credentials and then they uh, save these papers onto their server. Because of this, uh, of course, there are several copyright issues um, that, that uh, originate. Uh, and uh, because of this, of course, uh, Sci-Hub has already been sued twice in the US. Um, and in both cases, uh, it lost by default. And uh, since then, however, it has been cycling through domains. 
So uh, what this basically means is that now they use several domains and the website is available on, uh, let's say, this one today, but this one tomorrow and so forth. So they cycle through these domains periodically. Um, uh, what uh, Sci-Hub takes as input is that you can either put in the URL of the uh, the page of the uh, paper. So for instance, a PubMed URL uh, or um, you know a journal URL where the paper is actually hosted. Um, you can just enter the PMID of the paper. You could also enter the DOI of the paper. DOI stands for, uh, it's basically um, a digital uh, uh, signature that uh, basically um, is similar to PMID in function. So uh, DOI uh, is something that it will take. It will also take a typical search string. So for instance, if uh, I have a paper title, uh, I can just copy paste the paper title over here and I'll get the access to the whole paper. Uh, DOI stands for Digital Object Identifier. Uh, and it is similar to PMID. PMID is typically a number, whereas DOI is a bit longer, but it serves the same purpose. Um, now talking about uh, operational focus, uh, in 2018, uh, Himmelstein et al. Uh, did, a, uh, they did a study on Sci-Hub um, and they discovered that the operational focus of the website seems to be to circumvent paywalls rather than compile all literature. So I think the vast majority of papers on the Sci-Hub uh, server tend to be paid papers. So um, it seems that their focus is to uh, make paid papers more widely accessible as compared to just compiling every literature uh, out there and somehow profiting from it. Um, in 2017, um, uh, uh, Grishak, uh, discovered that there were about 62 million papers on the Sci-Hub servers. Um, and in 2016, uh, Bohanan et al. Uh, published this, uh, um, this, this article which talked about how uh, there are about 3 million unique IP addresses that access uh, papers from um, uh, the Sci-Hub servers. Um, and uh, the downloaders uh, that that uh, belong to these IP addresses are basically uh, spread across the world uh, from every continent, all except Antarctica. So there seems to be a widespread usage of Sci-Hub going on. Uh, the next step in creating our database uh, is data curation. We finished with the literature survey. We have all our papers in place. Now, how do we extract the relevant information from these papers uh, so that it can actually help us downstream with further annotation and analysis? Now, there are several points that uh, we should typically extract that most um, uh, LSDBs actually offer uh, that actually help us a lot in presenting the data that we've collected in a very structured manner. Um, the first, of course, is the PMID. Uh, as we've discussed, it helps us backtrack uh, and locate where our entry is actually coming from. Um, the next is disease. Uh, what particular disease is being studied? So like we discussed, um, uh, even breast cancer is of several types. So you, if, you're, if you're going through a paper, you, you might want to talk about which exact type or subtype of breast cancer or any other disorder for that matter you're talking about. Now to help with this, uh, we have something called OMIM. Uh, which is basically on uh, online uh, Mendelian inheritance in man. Uh, this is a database uh, that uh, catalogs um, Mendelian disorders and all the genes and variants that are associated with those disorders. Uh, now, this uh, website is extremely uh, important in describing the disease because what it does is uh, just as PubMed assigns uh, unique IDs to uh, unique papers, um, uh, OMIM assigns uh, unique uh, disease IDs uh, in the form of a hash followed by a particular number to diseases. So if I look for breast cancer, uh, I would I would uh, find this um, this uh, uh, particular ID. Um, I can search through the website by disease. Uh, so I can just enter uh, breast cancer and I'll be redirected to a page which will have all types of breast cancer, one of which would be bearing this particular ID. Um, so uh, I can, of course, also search by ID and so forth. But if I'm looking through a paper, 
um, and I uh, come across a particular type of a disorder, I can then copy paste that disorder into the OMIM uh, interface. Um, and of the results that it gives me, uh, I would I should ideally then look at the paper uh, and compare that which subtype of uh, the disorder the paper is typically talking about. So uh, usually papers don't really uh, some papers don't uh, mention the specific type or specific subtype, although a lot of papers do mention the exact OMIM ID uh, so as to remove all confusion as to which particular type of a disorder you're talking about. Uh, but in case the OMIM ID or an exact description is missing, um, you can just uh, uh, go through the paper and uh, just uh, you know select the closest disease description that matches with your uh, uh, the output that you will get from OMIM. Uh, copy that ID and uh, you know keep it separately. Uh, the next thing you should look for in your paper is of course what mutation is being talked about and what amino acid change is being talked about. Um, Followed by this, the mutation effect. So in a line, uh, maybe you can talk about how this particular mutation in uh, which particular gene is leading to what particular effect on a disease. So um, a disease may be caused with or without a mutation, but in case there is a mutation, what is the effect that is causing? Or what is the phenotype that is resulting and so forth? You can maybe just summarize it um, succinctly and uh, you know, add it to your database. Uh, next uh, is page, patient description. Um, so uh, it basically talks about the clinical condition of the patient. Uh, it could involve factors such as the age of onset of the disease, um, what the symptoms are, uh, what are the other clinical manifestations and so forth. So uh, papers will typically tell you exactly what uh, the patient uh, or the proband is undergoing. Uh, a proband is the main uh, patient that is being studied or the main uh, person bearing a mutation who's being studied. So um, typically papers, specifically if they're talking about diseases, they would give you a patient description and they would have these things and you can uh, you know, copy those lines and keep them separately. Uh, the next is ethnicity. Now ethnicity is something that is based on the similarities uh, that people have within or amongst each other. So for instance, they may have a common ancestor, uh, they may have a common language, uh, they may have a you know, so common socio-cultural experience. So all of that would fall under ethnicity. Uh, examples of ethnicity would be, uh, let's say a person is an Asian or is an American Indian, uh, which basically means native Indian or is Hispanic or black or white or so forth, that would be their uh, ethnicity. Next is geographical origin. Um, this basically will talk about the region, town, country uh, a person is in. Uh, so paper will typically tell you where a study is being conducted. Uh, they will tell you which hospital it is, which country or state or city it is. So you can actually uh, take all of this information from there um, and, and collect it. Uh, and next is what kind of a population we are talking about. So population uh, over here would be an overarching uh, uh, group that surpasses borders. So for instance, if I'm talking about um, Arabs, uh, the Arabic population, it actually uh, involves 23 countries. Um, and if I talk about South Asian population, uh, and several databases actually do refer to South Asian populations. Uh, so South Asians would contain um, Indians, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, Bangladeshis, and so forth. So it would be an overarching group uh, that surpasses all boundaries. Next would be the mode of inheritance, uh, which basically means the manner in which the disease is genetically inherited. I think uh, this has been discussed in great detail before. Uh, the typical uh, modes that you would encounter in papers would be, of course, AD, in which just one copy uh, of uh, a variant, uh, one damaged allele, basically is enough to cause a disease. Autosomal recessive, in which both copies have to be mutated, uh, X-linked, and mitochondrial. Uh, the zygosity, which basically uh, talks about the number of alleles affected, whether it is a homozygous or a heterozygous mutation. Um, the genetic origin of the mutation. So uh, here the genetic origin means which cell the mutation basically arose from. So was it a germline uh, cell? 
uh, a, a germline rotation which basically uh, occurs in germ cells uh, sperm and uh, ovum um, somatic mutation which is the uh, somatic occurs in the somatic cells of the body or both so a disorder can actually be uh, present in either so in that case you would select both um, then uh, we would talk about techniques for genotyping so how exactly did you find this mutation in the paper um, what uh, was the exact technique used so genotype of course is the genetic makeup of an individual um, and um, you can uh, there are several uh, techniques that you can use to actually determine uh, what mutation a person actually has so you by uh, genotyping you are actually finding the uh, variations in the particular genotype of a person uh, and several uh, uh, techniques such as dna sequencing which includes all of these sanger sequencing uh, pyro sequencing and so forth or it could be whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing and so forth um, if you just go through the paper uh, they actually uh, under the materials and methods section would have uh, explained the technique in great detail and you can take your details from there uh, the next uh, is the genome build. Uh, we've discussed genome builds before, uh, and it becomes extremely important to know uh, which genome build is being referred to. Uh, a paper might or might not report it, but if it does, it's important we know which uh, which build they're talking about. Uh, the two uh, builds that are uh, the most commonly used now, of course, as we've discussed, is our uh, GRCH37 or 38, also known as FG19 or 38, respectively. Uh, next, we should know what gene is uh, the paper talking about. Uh, as I said, uh, there are several uh, disorders um, that are linked to more than one gene. If it's just a single gene uh, related disorder, it would be a monogenic disorder. But typically, most disorders are linked with more than one gene. So it's extremely important to know what gene is being talked about. Um, you can, uh, uh, the paper will talk about the gene, but if it doesn't, you can just take the uh, mutation or anything else that basically the paper uh, describes. Um, and uh, you can maybe go and search uh, on the NCBI gene page and get more information. If you just want more information about the gene, uh, you can go to this website. Genes are typically alphanumeric. Uh, and when you visit this website, you should make sure that you uh, look only for homo sapiens genes because uh, this website actually, or this database actually catalogs uh, other species genes as well. Next would be chromosome number. What chromosome does this gene lie on? This information again would be present on the uh, gene page. So if you go to gene, you search for S uh, SDHD. And if you click on uh, homo sapiens entry for SDHD, you will find uh, a lot more details including the chromosome number there um, next would be um, an rsid uh, again dbsnp is uh, uh, also hosted on the ncbi database um, the snp id uh, that we've discussed in the previous class is an rsid a unique id that will uh, allot to uh, a particular variant so that is something that you should take and uh, we saw why in the last class and uh, an rsid can actually give uh, you know using tools like Mutilizer give you access to all the other HGVS IDs. So it's good if a paper reports a variant in terms of an RSID. So you should definitely collect this RSID either from the paper or go to um, uh, you know one of these NCBI websites and find out what SNP ID is actually associated with your variant. Uh, you should also collect the ClinVar ID. Uh, as I told you before, ClinVar uh, is basically a database that talks about clinically uh, relevant variants uh, and it actually allots an accession ID, uh, a submission accession ID to each of the uh, submissions that are made to it. So uh, your variants page would also typically have a submission accession ID, which you should copy so as to know which page basically to go to when you talk, want to look at that particular variant in greater detail later. And of course, uh, you should um, also generate all the HGVS IDs like we did in the last class. Along with HGVS IDs, uh, we have to go one step further here. Uh, we also have to collect the start and end position of the variant. Now, uh, start and end position basically means uh, the chromosomal position uh, of 
the variant where does the uh, variant lie on the chromosome and as we started in the last class uh, this chromosomal position is uh, typically uh, represented by the form of ncids uh, in uh, hgds so um, an ncid will basically tell you what the chromosomal position of your variant is the start position of your variant is uh, along with this, you should also collect information on what ref and alt nucleotides your variant is talking about. Um, this again can be obtained from the NCID itself. Okay, now let us look at how we can curate the data by the means of an example. This week, let's assume you are a researcher working with colorectal cancer. During your work, you come across this paper and you want to curate all the important information that is presented in this paper. The first thing you do, of course, is you collect the PMID. Uh, you already probably have the PMID, which is how you access this paper. Or you can just search for this paper on Google uh, along with the keyword PMID and you will find it. Next, uh, let's look at what disease the paper talks about. Here we can see it is HNPCC, uh, which is uh, basically hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer. It is also known as Lynch syndrome. So you collect this. Next, you notice the mutation, which is uh, 226C2T, and the gene, which is the MSH2 gene. Next, uh, you search through the paper more. And you find that the OMIM ID is this, and that the inheritance is autosomal dominant. This entire section would tell you more about what the mutation effect is, uh, and you can uh, write that in your own words. Next, uh, you look at uh, this particular section, which talks about the patient description. Notice that she's a Kuwaiti female, so the geographical origin is Kuwait. The population, therefore, would be uh, the Arab population. Uh, you see that uh, the mutation is a heterozygous mutation in the proband, which is the female that we are studying, and that the technique used is DNA sequencing. Next, you find out that the mutation is actually a germline mutation and that the protein change is a glutamine being terminated at the 76th position. So the AA change, amino acid change, is P dot this. And if you remember, the mutation change was C dot 226C2T. Uh, you go through the paper further and you realize that a build is not mentioned. Therefore, let's go with, for this example, GRCH37 or HG19 build. Now, uh, we have here a P dot part and a C dot part, but we don't have the complete NP or an NMID for, for our variant. So what can we do to obtain the uh, NP and the uh, NM parts? The answer is very simple. Uh, what we do is that we go to um, the NCBI gene database. Uh, I've shared the link previously, or you can simply Google uh, NCBI plus gene. On the gene page, uh, you enter your gene name, which is MSH2. Uh, once you enter this, you will be redirected to this results page which contains a lot of um, MSH2 genes in different organisms. So you have a house mouse, you have Saccharomyces cerevisiae and so on, but you are only interested in Homo sapiens. So make sure this is what you select. Um, right here itself, you can already see that the chromosome in question is chromosome two. So you can actually take note of this information. Next, you go to MSH2, you click here, and you're further sent to a page that has further details about your gene. It will tell you what the name of your gene is, um, it will tell you the organism, 
it will tell you the official HGNC symbol is in fact MSH2. It will give you a host of other information uh, depending on what you're looking at. We can actually go through all of this. Uh, next, if you scroll down, um, it will in fact give you your NCID for GRCH37, which is this, or your NCID for your GRCH38, which is this. Um, if you come down to the genomic regions, transcripts, and pro product section, uh, you find a link here which talks about the reference sequence details. If you click on this, uh, you will scroll down the page automatically and reach the reference sequences or the RefSeq part of this page. So here, uh, this, this part will basically contain all your IDs, including your NGID and your NM and corresponding NPIDs. So in this case, we see that there are two NMIDs uh, in, this, uh, in this gene. Uh, so the first one and the corresponding NPID, uh, the page says that this is uh, the longer transcript of the two. Uh, and in general, uh, the first transcript is usually uh, the canonical or the most important transcript. Uh, but you can go through the descriptions and uh, check which one you would uh, actually like to go with. Uh, in this case, uh, since it's the longer one and it is a reviewed um, transcript, we will go with this one. So using this, we can create our NMID, uh, just add a colon and create, uh, fill in the C dot part. And similarly, the NPID with the colon and the P dot part. So now we have our NM and NPIDs. Uh, to create an NCID, we can go to Mutilizer. Uh, the position converter tool, as we saw the last time, will take our NMID as input. Uh, we click on Convert Variant Description and we find that this is our NCID. So now we have our NM, NP, and NCIDs to collect and work with. Uh, next, we need to collect an RSID, which basically talks about the DVSNP ID. So we go to uh, RS, uh, the SNP page, the DVSNP page, uh, by following this link or simply Googling uh, DVSNP plus NCBI. Uh, in the search bar here, we put in our NMID. Uh, any other ID would do as well. Uh, but if we put in our NMID, for instance, um, we would be redirected to a page. Uh, this page right here has your RSID on it. Sometimes the same page will have uh, multiple other RSIDs also, uh, but uh, the first one is the one that you go with. So you click here. Uh, again, you will be redirected to another page. So this is the RSID right here on this redirected page. Uh, you can find a host of information here as well, um, including uh, the, the details of your variant, your NC and NG IDs that you can collect from here, uh, the allele frequencies associated with your variant, the NGVS nomenclature associated with it, um, the clinical significance associated with it. So you can see that uh, the uh, disease name is Lynch syndrome, uh, which is the same uh, disease that we're talking about. And the clinical significance is pathogenic. Uh, so please note this RSID. Um, also, we see here a link to ClinVar. So um, ClinVar will give you all of this information and more. So if you ever have a variant, that has a ClinVar page, it's always advisable to check it out. Um, if I go to my ClinVar page now, so this is the page that I will land on. Uh, as you can see, it talks about our variant 226C2T uh, with the termination happening at the 76th position. Uh, we see the overall uh, clinical significance or ClinSIG is pathogenic and that this variant has been reviewed by an expert panel. Uh, so we can note the ClinSIG as pathogenic here. 
uh, further, it gives us a host of other information. For instance, it will give us all our LGVS IDs in one place, NMIDs and associated NPIDs, both our NCIDs for each genome build. It will tell us our protein change. So uh, 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 termination is denoted by a star here. And it will also give us a link to DBSNP. Now if we come down here and we look at the submitted interpret interpretations and evidence. We see uh, that uh, a Lynch syndrome entry has been uh, uh, associated with a pathogenic status and that this variant has been or this entry has been reviewed by an expert panel. Uh, therefore, uh, we collect this accession ID right here, which starts with an SCV typically. Uh, so this would be our ClinVar ID. Uh, if we ever search through the NCBI website with this uh, accession ID, we would always land on this page. So it's an easy way of uh, uh, kind of bookmarking this page for our own reference. Another thing we notice is the genomic location. So the position of the variant, uh, of course, would vary based on the assembly we are talking about. Uh, in case of GRCH37, which is uh, g 19 we see uh, this particular position in this, the two represents the chromosome, followed by a codon, followed by the position of the variant. So this is the chromosomal position of the variant. Uh, if I look at my NCID, I see that the same chromosomal position uh, is mentioned here also. So uh, this chromosomal position is basically what our NCID tells us. So we see a lot of information is provided by our uh, ClinVar page, and it is typically very important to note this down. Um, so we see that we have now for the build GRCH37, collected all our four IDs, we collected the chromosome number, the ClinVar ID, the clinical significance, which is pathogenic, as well as the DBSNP ID. Now, uh, based on all the data we have created, we can actually process this data uh, in such a manner that it can later be converted into a VCF in case we need it. Uh, we've discussed uh, VCF formats uh, in a previous session. Um, but how do we curate our data so that it becomes compatible uh, with a VCF format? For that, uh, we need a couple of things. The first thing would be uh, a position followed by uh, ref and alt. So in this case, um, uh, we would collect this information in this form. Our variant is a substitution. Um, and this is the NCID of the variant. So this is the genomic position as we just saw on the ClinVar page um, and the variant is a C to T substitution. So our start position would be this uh, particular position. Uh, since uh, the change is taking place at the same position, our end would be the same position as well. Our reference elite would be a C and the alt would be a T uh, which is taking the place of the C. Similarly, uh, depending on the type of the variation, we can collect this information for other variants also. Uh, let's look at a substitution uh, first by the means of an example. Let's say I have to mark the attendance for a class uh, on day one. I see uh, all my students here. Uh, I see that the third student here is this boy with white hair and this girl on the fourth position uh, with black hair. On day two, however, I notice uh, that the girl in the fourth position has been replaced by someone else with green hair. Uh, this would uh, talk about my variant. So this girl was my C, who has been replaced by my T. Both are at the fourth position. So uh, the reference is my C and the alt is my T. The reference position in both cases remains the same, which is the fourth position. Next, if we talk about a deletion, uh, let's assume it's the same variant, but instead of uh, the same uh, position, we have, uh, instead of a submission, a deletion going on here. 
Um, so in this case, um, how do I show uh, my DCF that a deletion is taking place? For this, uh, what I do is that I take the help of an upstream nucleotide to earmark the position of the deleted uh, C. So uh, I basically talk about uh, a, a, a nucleotide that is present at the 4, 7, 6, 3, 5, 5, 5, 3 position, uh, which is one before the 5, 5, 5, 4 position of the del C, of the C nucleotide. So my reference would be GC, whereas my alt would be only a G because the C has been deleted. Uh, if I look at an example for this, I see uh, that in the first day, I have my uh, uh, G and C. The G would be the boy and the C would be the girl. In the second day, uh, the C has been deleted. Uh, so my reference in this case is the boy. The boy is acting as my reference. The G nucleotide is the reference to say that the, boy, uh, that the uh, child sitting next to the boy is absent today. So... Uh, the nucleotide that is uh, next to the G nucleotide has been deleted. Talking next about insertions, um, if I say uh, that instead of a C, I have next to a C an A nucleotide inserted, I would say uh, the reference would be my C allele, uh, the alt would be a CA. So, in terms of this example, um, I say that um, the reference is the girl, C. Um, the alt is a boy that has been added between these two girls. So the alt would be uh, this girl and this boy. The reference would just be this girl. So the reference is C and the alt is CA, which is to say that uh, a boy is now sitting next to this girl. Uh, talking about uh, delins or indels, uh, which uh, consist of a deletion as well as an insertion, um, I would see um, in the ref, I would talk about uh, the deleted nucleotide, uh, whereas in the alt, I would talk about the inserted nucleotides. So the reference uh, is, that, uh, is, is that this girl is sitting right here, or this is my C nucleotide. The alt is these two girls who are now sitting in place of this girl. So the alt is an AT. So this is how I would uh, denote my reference and alt nucleotides depending on the kind of a mutation that I'm talking about. Now, uh, how do I find the one upstream nucleotide that I uh, just spoke about? Um, there is a very simple way of doing this. That all I do is that I Google uh, UCSC genome browser. It leads me to this page. On this page, I go to genomes and I click on GRCH37 or NG19. This would lead me to another page, which typically looks like this. So over here, I put in uh, uh, my uh, nucleotide position in this way. I say that it is a two, which is basically the chromosome, followed by a colon, followed by the position that I'm looking at. This is the same uh, means in which uh, the genomic location was described in Klimbar as well, if you remember. So uh, 5554 is where my C is at, I know. Uh, I want to now know uh, what is present in uh, 5553, which is one uh, nucleotide upstream. So I enter this here, click go, and I find that my result shows me both the nucleotides. Uh, so uh, this is my C nucleotide and one upstream to this is the G nucleotide. So this is how I know that G is the nucleotide that I have to assign uh, to uh, create a reference. So with this, uh, we come to an end of all the uh, columns that we were supposed to fill out. Um, if I look at this uh, in terms of a spreadsheet, um, all the entries that I have collected so far, I can actually represent them in this way. Um, so the HGVS IDs, the chromosome uh, start, end, ref, alt, and so forth, um, 
all of this data can actually uh, be presented in the form of a spreadsheet so that we can access it more easily. Um, and thus, uh, I can keep adding my variants uh, underneath this to uh, fill up this sheet. And this sheet can then act, act as my database. So if I look at um, the other columns here, I have all of my data. And this is how I can represent all of my data. Now, coming to the applications of uh, the curation that we've done so far, um, the first application, of course, is that it will help us, uh, all of this data, it can actually help us establish uh, the genotype phenotype correlations. So uh, for a given genotype, just by going through the papers, we know that this is the gene, uh, the variant present in the gene, and this is the phenotype that the patient is reporting. Uh, and also we can do further analyses to see if that is indeed the case. So these databases help us establish this relationship. Uh, next, uh, they help us understand the gene functions and the effects uh, that variants have on these gene functions. So uh, we know what a healthy gene does, but in the case a variant is present, uh, we've seen what the effect is going to be. So this database helps us with that. Uh, thirdly, it helps us provide a map of the ethnic or geographical distribution of diseases and genetic uh, variants that uh, determine the origins of these diseases. So basically, um, in our further downstream analysis, we can actually map uh, allele frequencies to each of these variants. Uh, these allele frequencies will tell us uh, that one particular variant is present in uh, how much uh, or how frequently is it reported in a particular geographical location. So you can actually study uh, populations and subpopulations by the means of allele frequency analysis. Uh, these uh, databases further help uh, clinicians and diagnostic labs uh, by A, giving them information about the pathogenicity uh, or telling us whether the variant is benign and so forth. Uh, B, they help us uh, understand the genotype phenotype correlation. Um, and C, uh, they tell us the population specific uh, allele frequencies. And also, um, if the allele frequency uh, uh, is in a specific aberrant range, or if the variant is pathogenic, we can also use these variants uh, to earmark them for screening. Uh, so that is another purpose that these serve. And finally, uh, all of this information, when processed properly, uh, actually uh, gives uh, us a lot of detail that can be used uh, by, uh, let's say, molecular biologists who can utilize this information about the variants um, and create in vitro assays to study the structure and function relationships that are present uh, in these genes and these variants. So uh, there are several applications uh, based on the data that you collect, uh, depending on the uh, main aim that your data uh, collection uh, is towards. Um, and any and all of these could actually be used. With this, we come to an end of our session today. Uh, thank you for listening. If there are any doubts, uh, I'd be more than happy to take them. Thanks a lot.